And uh, if you've not seen the photographs that that takes in portrait mode, uh, you're, you're missing out. Uh, it's pretty amazing to just see what that thing can do. And I just began to think about, you know, I have an old Samsung, not even in the right family. You know, I have a, I have a Samsung S5, and so I'm really a reject. But and my, my phones, I'm trying to keep up, but, you know, there's no competition. This thing's amazing what it can do, just in, in it fits in your pocket. It's amazing what technology has evolved into, right? And, and I began to think about it this morning. I just wanted to share a message, and that popped into my head. And I thought, you know, some people still don't have cell phones. I won't blow anybody up, but some of them are in my own family, and I got some of my DNA from one of them. And, um, and uh, but imagine, I mean, it's pretty amazing if you think about it. It's, you've got to be pretty determined to, to avoid a cell phone by now. Not even a flip phone, not even a dumb phone. Not, no, uh, hey, he made it to his 60s without it and figured, why do I need one now in my 70s? Um, so, but my, my mom's got one, so that, that, he's, he's kind of covered there. And uh, honey, call this. Honey, do that. Honey, look up the directions. Honey, you know, he's, he's actually pretty slick. He, he, uh, he's a lot smarter. I don't think he's here yet this morning, so I can pick on him a little bit. Um, but anyway, so I'm just thinking, here, here is 8S. I mean, this is the greatest thing Apple's come out with lately. And uh, if he, my, let's say my dad decided to go buy a phone, he's never even had a, I mean, he would, he would just suddenly have the most amazing phone out there, right? He suddenly jumps to the front of the line. He's got this amazing piece of technology. He never had to go through. I mean, he wouldn't know that a BlackBerry isn't just a piece of fruit, that it was actually a phone. It was actually a device one time. You remember that you had to try to figure out that little round ball on the, on the thing? You know, that, that was a smartphone back in the day. And that's less than 10 years ago, folks. It's amazing how fast it's all changing. But, but all of a sudden... Just on a decision, he'd be right in the front of the line. And Jesus told a story about that because I'd be a little bit, man, frustrated. How does he just get to jump right into smartphone age at the 8S and skipped all the stuff that led up to that? Never had to fumble around with that little ball that was stuck. He had to blow on it, and then he got it too wet, with, and then it wouldn't work. And he never had to do all that stuff. He just jumped right to the front. And Jesus told a story in Matthew 20 about some workers that went into a vineyard. And the, the landowner paid them all the same, even though some were hired in the beginning of the day, some in the middle of the day, and some right at the last hour of the day. They worked for an hour and got the same wage as the guy that worked all day long even though the guy that worked all day long received a fair day's wage but he was embittered by the fact that some people had just jumped in at the end in obedience to Christ and yet they, they by comparison lost the blessing and we had a conversation last night Jeremiah and I was just he's sharing a story of someone that he uh, listens to their podcast and how how many times in life do we curse our blessing Jesus had a couple of uh, loaves and a, and a few fish and and, and blessed it, and look what happened. He fed 5,000 people, and yet sometimes because we don't have as much as the next person, or they seem to have gotten it a lot easier than we did, all of a sudden we can, we can complain about what we've got and miss the fact that that, if we would just bless it and give thanks for it, could be the very thing that God wants to use to bless the people around us and to multiply that for his glory. But I just want to encourage you this morning that you still you got to get in the game. Whether it's just a loaf and a fish, whatever it is that you can bring in this time of offering, bring it with a full heart, but bring it gladly and bring it understanding that don't compare it to what other people seem to be able to do or what you've done in the past, but now you can't do anymore. And so you've, you've restricted. Continue to invest because there's another parable about the guys with talents. And we understand that if you don't, if you receive a talent and do nothing with it, that's really what, what grieves the heart of the Lord because he knows he wants to watch over the stuff that you entrust him with so that he can bless it. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you, get in the game. I think probably everybody here, except maybe one or two or maybe a couple, uh, not meaning to be derogatory toward you, maybe you never got the, the cell phone. Well, let me encourage you, jump in now, because you can watch TV on your phone. You can take amazing pictures and videos, TV quality videos on your phone now. So it's, it's, a, it's a tool, not just something to call people with. But uh, get in the game, Whatever, wherever you're at. Maybe you've just thought that, you know, it's insignificant what I can bring to the table. We're in a day and age, in a season, as the kingdom of God is, is, is taking ground on, the, on this planet. It's going to require everybody, however big or however small. If you've just got a little bit, bring it and trust the Lord to see what he'll do with that this morning. I really felt like I want to encourage you with that. Don't disqualify what you can bring, what you feel the Lord telling you to bring. And if it's a couple million dollars, that's great. We know how to process the extra zeros as well. We we're not going to struggle with that either. Uh, but, but, it, but, but seriously, just ask the Lord, show me what... Where do I fit? How do I enter this game? Where do I jump in? Because just because you might feel like you're coming in late or you've, you've never really been into this, I want to encourage you to invest this morning. I just get a sense in my spirit, just spending some time with these folks of faith and just the worship and the atmosphere. God really wants to do something amazing in our generation, in our, in our geography here, especially in Kingston, New York, as a local church. And so let's just have the ushers come forward and I'll just pray. Father, I thank you this morning 
That, Lord, wherever we find ourselves at in this, in this life, whether we feel like we have a lot or a little based on comparing ourselves to other people, Father, help us to stop doing that so that we can just see what it is you've given to us and how it is you want us to use that in this kingdom that you've called us to. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the blessing that you give to our lives because it adds a value to us way beyond what money can ever do. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of knowing you this morning and being able to give to the cause you've called us to in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ushers, go ahead and pass that around. I'm just going to take a, a minute this morning and introduce uh, Courtney and Jeremiah. Actually, I, I can't even do that. Maybe they'll just spend a second and say a little. I think they're going to try to come as much as they can twice a year and just knit in with us. They're, they're part of our tribe. They, they resonate with us. We had a worship time uh, with our worship team in our living room yesterday. And uh, Jeremiah just played his finger prints off and uh, just uh, just sitting on a chair in the living room and the, the anointing of the Lord the, the presence of God just in that simple place of just a couple guitars gathered and some people just singing right Wendy it was just beautiful it was so refreshing and 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 there's just there's a genuineness of person that God has just blessed them with and because of that we trust them fully there's a there's an open heart that we extend towards them when they come you know we don't give them a you know notes and this is the topic that we're on please don't deviate now they come uh, with a fresh word from the Lord whatever God's given them to bring to us and I just want to receive them, welcome them. We're not going to receive another offering for them, so I'm just going to mention this now. After the service, please uh, consider making a donation at the welcome desk. You can use a credit card or whatever. They fly in at their own expense. They don't make demands of us, like we need this, this, and this, and a green room, and all these other things that, that uh, a lot of the folks that have come and, and been a part of ministering here have, have said they needed uh, so that they can kind of have insulation from the common folks and themselves. I don't know. It just drives me nuts. Um, but there's just a, just a simple heart of worship and love for the Father that is evident in them and in their children and uh, because of that, we just love their heart for the nations. They travel all over this planet, ministering in places that can't afford to pay uh, them for what they're doing. But they do it because they know that's what they're supposed to do, and God's called them to do it. So when we give to them, we're actually investing in the nations. We're not just investing in a couple uh, with two kids that, um, just, that, that, are, that are like us, but we're also investing in the nations, and we're sowing a seed. And so please be generous. Grab a CD if, uh, if you like music. You still have a CD player, and everything's on your phone now if you've... Unless you're, you know, a few of those other folks and you probably still got a cassette player that you will have to adapt the CD backwards for you. Um, but at any rate, we just want to welcome, are you coming first? She's just, we're just going to welcome Courtney straight away this morning. We'll grab a podium for her. God bless you. Good morning. Ah, it's always so good to be here with all of you. It feels like family now. And so I'm just going to jump. I'm going to tell some stories along the, along the way. Sorry, I've got like a little, thanks. <clears throat> I've been doing that all morning. Some stories along the way to bring you guys up to date since we were last here in March. But um, they'll come as I'm, as I'm sharing this message because I was, I was out running earlier this week. We actually were in Boston last weekend ministering at a church there and got home at like 1 in the morning on Monday. And I had gone out for a jog later in the day. And I was praying for you guys. I was praying for this church. And because we have the relationship that Josh described, we're always you know, like kind of excited to come up here and it just feels simple and easy. And not that we're not always excited to go, but you know what I mean? This feels like we're going to like be with our people and it just feels easy, you know? So I was just praying for y'all like, ah, oh, what do you want to do? And, and then just clear as day, like I'm running down this road and it's like, stay the course, stay the course. And I just, the whole rest of my little jog, that's all I heard. Stay the course, stay the course. And that phrase is really significant for me with my walk in the Lord. And so I was like, okay, Jesus. So I feel like I have this word for you this morning that maybe is just for King's Fire Church this weekend. Who knows? I may preach it in other churches. I don't know. But I really feel like it is, it is I've never preached this before. And I feel like it's for all of you. So we're going to talk about staying the course. So, of course, then I, you know, I got home. And uh, I was like, I need, a, I need a look up. I know what stay the course means to me, but I want to like look up what that means, you know? So I did a little quick Google search. And of course, it's a battle term. It's a war term. But listen to this definition. Stay the course to pursue a goal regardless of obstacles or criticism to continue in what you are pursuing or planning to do until it is finished. And when I read that last little part, it is finished, I was like, boom. I was like, oh, I know one who stayed the course quite well, right? I know one who, who laid out the blueprint for us, who laid out the model to get to that point where he hung on the cross and he said, I have stayed the course, right? He battled in the Garden of Gethsemane. He hung on that cross and finally 
breathed his last breath as he said, it is finished. And the veil was turned, torn, the purpose was complete. And I thought, okay, God, we got to get to our it is finished, right? We can't quit along the way. We have to stay the course. So how? How are you going to stay the course in this pursuit, not only of Jesus, but of his kingdom here on this earth and what he wants to do to bring his kingdom everywhere you go in everything that you do through your life? So first, I want to go to Psalm 27. I love Psalm 27. If you have a smartphone <laughs> with your Bible app or you're old school like me and you still like to hold the old thing. Uh, oh, one of our little info cards <laughs> falling out of my thing. Um, go to Psalm 27. So David wrote this Psalm and he starts with the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He's encouraging himself. David was excellent at encouraging his own self of stirring himself up in his spirit, man, not expecting other people to do it for him, but he himself would say, this is what I see. Evil men are coming against me. The enemies are coming after me, but I am going to turn my eyes away from the circumstances that I see, away from the evil that I fear to the one that I know that I can trust. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then he says in verse four, I need readers or something. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. How do you stay the course? First, you become a seeker because the safest place for you is in the seeking. As long as you are constantly seeking him, as long as you are turning your face to her, toward him, you will be safe because you'll be in a place where you can listen. You'll be in a place where the Holy Spirit can correct you if you're starting to get off course a little bit. You'll be in a place where he can whisper guidance, where he can say leap, where he can say stand, where he can just guide you by his eye, right? Where he's not having to treat you like the horse with the brittle and he's turning you. This is more of Psalms I'm quoting to you right now, where you have to turn you like a horse with something in your mouth. That's not the kind of followers that Jesus wants. He wants people whose eyes are so focused on him that with one glance of his eye, yes, Lord, this is what you're asking of me. But it's in the seeking that you stay in that safe place where you know you can stay in march with your leader, right? If we're truly in a battle, then we have to stay in march with the, with the pace that our leader, that our general has set before us. Now I want you to jump. He goes on to talk about in the day of trouble. And he's, he's basically in a really difficult time. And this song is coming out of that. But look here at verse 8. I love this verse. My heart says of you, seek his face. So your face, Lord, I will seek. Thank God that when we need it most, when we serve the Lord, we have this voice deep within us that our heart can say to us, Courtney, now is the time to seek. Seek his face, Courtney. And our response has to be, yes, God, your face, Lord, I will seek. So how do we stay the course? By seeking him, by turning our face to him, and then look what happens. Then you see David come to the place of staying the course. Jump to the end, verse 13. He lists all this stuff through all these verses that are coming against him. But I am still confident of this. All right. He's back to his good, his good pace. You know, he's like, all right, I'm going to stay the course. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So how do you stay the course? You seek him above everything else. You make him the number one priority in your life. The second part of how you stay the course, Lamentations chapter 3. You have to remember and be satisfied. About four weeks ago, I was driving my dog to the groomer. And I'm driving in the car. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Courtney, I want you to go back and read the last 10 years of your journals. I want you to remember and be satisfied. Because. And that was all I heard. And I was like, because what, Jesus? That was like a cliffhanger, you know, <laughs> like because something wonderful is getting ready to happen. You know, what's the because? Now, I am an avid journaler, journaler. I think I just invented that word. I write avidly in journals. And from the day I met Jesus, like I had this radical encounter with Christ when I was 18. 
And he was doing so much in my life so fast. And I was so grateful that I had people around me that were like, write this stuff down. Can I just encourage you this morning? Everything that we're reading here was basically people's journals. These were just people chronicling what was happening as they lived out the kingdom of God. Write down what God is doing in your life. The good, the bad, the ugly, the hopeless, the joyful, all of it. Write it down. Because right now, for four weeks, I have a lot of journals for the last 10 years. I have a box full sitting next to my bed. I went and found them all. I've been serving the Lord for 20 years now. So it's half the time I've been serving Jesus. And I've been for four weeks. It's all, I'm not reading any books. And for those who know me, you know how much I love to read. I'm just reading my own journals. And it has been unbelievable. It has been unbelievable to look back and to remember his faithfulness. To look back and see the, the times where I was at the end of myself. Where I was like, God, where did you go? Like, what if, where did you go? I, I know you're there, but I don't feel like you're there. You know? And then watching him as I just kept holding on. As I just kept, I will not stop seeking you. I will not stop seeking you. And then in the beautiful times where miracles were happening, where the prayers were being answered. So I have a tendency to write down anything I'm praying, right? So I have my time with the Lord and I listen and I just, you know, spend time trying to hear his voice. And then I pray and, and randomly different things will come up outside of my personal prayer list, you know, and you just write it down. And it's so cool to go back and go, oh my God, I totally forgot praying that in September of 2010, but you actually answered that prayer for that person. And it's just amazing to see, to remember, and to be satisfied. And that word satisfied, I was like, why did you say be satisfied? Like that just struck me so much. Be satisfied means to be gratified to the full. It made me think of David where he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. But in Psalm 34, when David is doing that, we're not going to turn there. But in Psalm 34, when David is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, that is a powerful psalm because David, again, is in a terrible place. He writes that psalm when he's in the cave of Adullam. He writes that song right after he has left the gates of King Abimelech and has had to act like he's lost his mind. It says he had like spit drooling down his beard. He was the king. He was the one anointed. You know, like this man, and now here he is acting like a total crazy person just to save his own life and the life of the men that are with him in front of this king because he's been recognized and he's running from Saul. But in this moment where he could say, God, you've abandoned me. God, you have forsaken me. God, where are you? If you go read Psalm 34, which I encourage you to do as your homework, <laughs> go read Psalm 34 and you begin to see, he begins to almost prophesy over the future of his own life in this Psalm. And he begins to remember he remembers being the boy in the field and the lion came, right? And God intervened and helped him to kill the lion. He remembers the bear. He remembers Goliath. And that's where I believe that verse, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because he's not seeing the goodness of the Lord just yet, but he's seen it before. And the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, which has already been accomplished. And what? Exactly. So what is your testimony? When the storm is raging and you feel like nothing is happening and you have prayed and you have fasted and nothing is going the way you think it's going to go, that is the time to remember. That is the time to go, oh, but I remember. I remember when you did this, God. I remember that moment where I felt your presence and no matter what happens, no one can tell me what I did not feel in that moment. I know that you're real and I know that you love me. I can remember standing and weeping just because your love was so beautiful. I can remember when the provision came, when it seemed hopeless and somehow out of nowhere, you brought the finances, you opened an opportunity and we remember and we take a second to be satisfied to say, God, we are grateful. We're, we're not spoiled little children. You know, I have two boys and they're amazing, but sometimes they drive me crazy because there's never satisfaction. It's like, oh, well, we just got that thing and then we need the next thing and then we need the next. And it's hard. I feel like it's so hard for kids growing up in this day and age because they're constantly being bombarded with everything that they're being told they must have, you know, and our boys it's, they, they struggle. Like if you talk to my older son, Jed, because they, we take them everywhere with us, right? So they've been with the orphans of Uganda. They've been in the bush of Africa. They've seen what most American kids haven't seen. And so they fight with that thing in them like, ah, oh, 
I know that this isn't as important as all my friends are saying it is. I've seen the kids who have nothing, you know. And they, we, we sometimes act like that with Jesus. Or like spoiled little children with the father. Like, yes, God, I know you just provided. Yes, God, I know you just did this. Instead of just taking time to be thankful, we always put a but afterwards. But God, I still, but God, but I need, I want, please, God. And I just have been, it's been such a beautiful experience. Like to read all these 10 years with no judgment, with no anything, just like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm satisfied with all you've done in my life in the last 10 years. And so as part of that, as part of the remembering, Jeremiah and I were talking this morning. And just We just want to tell you a little bit from when we were here in March, we were getting ready to leave for France and Europe. We were in Portugal first and then France. And I think we shared maybe a little bit about how this France trip was just crazy we had been in Brazil a year prior, almost exactly a year ago now, and felt like God said, we, I'm sending you to France. We knew we were just supposed to go, but we didn't know where to go, where to buy a plane ticket, all that kind of stuff. We had this vision of this pastor crying out for help. And uh, to take a very long story and make it very short, God miraculously just brought us to this small town in the northeast Bretagne region of France, in a little northwest, sorry, um, and it was called Breast. And we met with these pastors. They've spent two days just loving on them. He's 81 years old. She's almost 70. They've spent the last 40 years of their lives plowing away in this small town in France with never their church never growing more than maybe 25, 30 people at its max. Now it's down to like eight or nine, which is really indicative of the spiritual climate in Europe right now. And it was, they were broken. Like, they, they had never met us before. We had never met them before. It was a girl who knew us from 20 years ago that connected. It was crazy. Like, we pulled up at the airport and, like, spotted them, like Jeremiah said, Friday night from a Facebook picture we had seen that was even the, kind of a blurry one. And we're like, I hope that's who you are. You look old enough to be the guy in that Facebook picture. <laughs> you know? And so then the guy, the man seemed a little mad, like, that we were there. And we were like, that was one of those moments we're both in the car driving with them. No Nobody, I'm translating all the French for all four of us. And we're both like, I'm going in my heart. I'm going, what are we doing here? This is insane. Like, he doesn't even want us here. He hates us already. You know, like, what are we doing here? And then that little Christ in me, stay the course, stay the course, stay the course. I'm getting ready to do something. Stay the course. And it turned into the most miraculous time with this couple and what will turn into what I believe will be many, many, many years of ministry in the nation of France and, and plowing and, and redigging wells there and, and reaching the, the Muslim people there and everything. After that, we went to Uganda with our kids and we did the love project that we do there every year. It was incredible. This year, we added in ministry training time. So these kids in the orphanage, there's about 55 of them that we've been working with for like seven years now. So we're watching them grow up. And so we have relationship, you know, and it's amazing. And our boys, too, which is the, the most amazing thing because they have their buddies there and two totally different lives and cultures. But then they, through Jesus, just find this place together as children. And it's beautiful. And so we spend all these days there with them just doing the arts, dance, and music, and drama, and training them. But then we have these ministry training times where we get all the older ones, all the ones like first grade and the little babies we don't do it with. But we get them all there together, and we teach them, you know, how do you pray for someone? We have the most precious picture of Elijah and his little buddy there, like, praying together. How do you lay hands on someone? How do you listen? How do you flow in the gifts of the Spirit? How do you stand up and share your testimony? How do you stand up and tell other people about Jesus? These kids are, like, 11 years old, and their stories would horrify you. But yet, in this moment, they are empowered sons and daughters of God and they begin to see who they are and they the outreach that we did at the end of the week with them was unbelievable we've had almost 400 people show up in the middle of this village just walking randomly from I mean, we were just like at first when we first got there you know it's it's Africa time it's kind of like Brazil time nothing ever actually starts on time and and so we're just waiting you know and it seems like nobody's coming and then a few trickle in a few trickle in within an hour there's like 400 people jammed all in under this little tin roof in this dirt floor where we were going to do this outreach and 
the kids got up and they preached and they shared their testimonies. And then, of course, they did all the art stuff. And it was amazing. You guys have seed in all of this. This church is with us. Y'all pray for us. You support us. Everything that we're doing, you have seed in with your lives. One of the, after that, we went to Brazil and Jeremy was, was in seven churches in seven nights preaching and leading worship. He could hardly speak by the time I talked to him at the last night. But one of those nights, he was invited to this citywide gathering in a stadium to lead worship. There were 53,000 people there. And I was home in Jacksonville, and he has this song in Portuguese, Nada mais satisfaz me alma. It means nothing else satisfies my soul, only you, Jesus. And a friend sent me this clip of 50,000 people singing not a my satisfies me all my at the top of their lungs like i was like i was watching it like oh my god this is beautiful jesus but i love this juxtaposition because then he comes home he and i cross paths because the boys weren't going on this trip and i go to our friends in hasifi that work on the streets of hasifi with the the girls and the women being rescued out of prostitution and i was there with them for this period of time and saw the Lord do this amazing story. I don't have time to tell the whole story, I don't think. Jeremy's giving the eye like, you need to tell the story. <laughs> you want me to tell the story? Okay, I'll tell it quick. So before we left, I, had, uh, I got up in the middle of the night, I was praying, and I had this little vision of myself going to a woman on the street and giving her this necklace. And then I had a word for her about this necklace and that God had this necklace for her. And I was flying out the next morning. And I said, Jesus, do I go to Walmart like in the middle of the night? What do I do? I don't have a necklace. You know, I feel like the Holy Spirit was like, no, I'm gonna bring you the necklace. And I was like, okay, well that complicates it even more, which should be fun. So, so I go, we see my friend, my friends pick me up at the airport and they had just flown in from ministering in another part of Brazil. And so the next morning we're having coffee and I start to tell my friend Rachel this story. And she goes, stop, I have your necklace. And she goes running out of the room, comes running back. And she said, I was in Brasilia last night. And this woman walks up to me at the end of the service and says, God spoke to me in the middle of the service and said, I have to give you this necklace. I mean, the beauty of the body of Christ and our obedience, even when we don't understand. And so she hands Rachel, her name's Rachel, a necklace, a golden necklace that says Carol. And Rachel's like, well, thank you. <laughs> My name's Rachel. You just gave me a Carol necklace. Like, okay. So her husband, Nick, was like, just take it. Who knows what God's going to do with it? So then the next morning, I'm sitting at her, her little table telling her, she's like, it's got to be this. So I'm like, okay, Lord. Then I'm narrowed down to a Carol. I'm searching for a Carol, you know? And so walking the streets, every place at the, the rescue home for girls everywhere, I'm like introducing, well, I still know me, which is how you ask, how, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? You know, I'm looking for my Carol. No Carols. The whole week passes. They do something called the Father's Love Banquet. So we spend the week canvassing the streets, inviting the women in prostitution and the men in prostitution to the Father's Love Banquet. And they come and they put on this huge feast at a fancy hotel, not far from the Avenida where the ladies work. And they just pour out the love of God on them and tell them about how the Father sees them and how much he loves them. And so we're there for the banquet. We're serving them this like five course dinner. And they're coming in, girls and guys alike. And they're coming in and the presence of God in that room was so beautiful. I can't even put it into words for you, but I still haven't met a Carol. And I'm sitting there and it's time to start the service part. Like everybody's done eating and these four women walk in the door and will pass like all these tables near them that have seats available and come sit at my table. So I start introducing myself. There was one woman that really intimidated me, really hard looking, a little older than the rest, like been there, done that, and probably would like to break me with her fingers, you know? And I'm staring at her super intimidated to making my way. And finally I look at her and she, she looks at me kind of like, Oh, please don't ask me what my name is. You know, like, I don't want to talk to you. But I asked her what her name is, and she just kind of stared at me, and she was like, Carol, which is how you say Carol, and they just, oh, they're ours in, Port in Brazil. And uh, I was like, of course. Of course, the last woman to walk into the room is going to be Carol, and the only one that looks like she actually hates me is going to be Carol, you know? <laughs> And so I'm like, now what do I do? So they start worship and the Lord's just like, start with that, start with Carol. So when it's time, I was the speaker that night and when it's time to get up and share, I just had the necklace and I just began to tell the story, never saying the name. And I just began to tell the story of the links that the Lord had gone to for this one woman. And this was the juxtaposition I wanted to show you. 
53,000 people in a stadium proclaiming the name of Jesus. And that is glory and beautiful. But I love of God that is that big and far bigger. But the same God who sees the one so perfectly, right? So perfectly that he will arrange all these pieces just to write an undeniable story of love for this woman. So I'm making my way across the room to her telling this story. And I walk up to her and I hand her the necklace. And I say, could you tell me what this necklace says? And I drop it in her hand. And she looks at it and just begins to weep, like just sitting at the table, just crying. And in that moment, the presence of God was just like, <sighs> and then the Lord, ah, oh, the rest of the night was miraculous. There's many more stories, but we don't have time for that. And then not long after that, Jeremiah was in Zambia with Overland Missions, which many of y'all are familiar with because you have a lot of people in this church that have been there and a part of what we do. And then, of course, in Boston last weekend. And so I just want to say thank you as we are remembering the goodness of God and the testimonies that he's given us. But in every one of those testimonies, because you are a part of this church and this church is a part of Ignition Point and all that we do, you have seed in all that we're doing. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We're so grateful. And our prayer is always that the seed would return to you a hundredfold, not just financially. Finances are awesome. But with your purpose and with the kingdom of God and the intimacy of relationship with the Father that is far beyond just having all of our needs met. Amen. Okay, so. <laughs> we got to finish staying the course. <laughs> so we seek him. We remember. And finally, to stay the course, we fight. And sometimes in the fighting, we take ground. And sometimes in the fighting, we stand, but we fight. So, of course, you know where I'm going to go, right? Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I love that verse because it doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where you are weak, he is strong, right? Let him fill in the gaps. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a super Christian. You never will be if you try. Just keep staying the course. Keep pursuing him. Keep seeking him. And as you seek him, you become more like him. And he fills in those parts of you and he will change you and he will strengthen you and he will help you overcome. But it's not because you trying to fix yourself all the time. It's from you keeping your eyes on him and allowing his spirit to fill you and change you. Right? And so you're strong in his might and his power. And you put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have to stand. We have to fight. You have to know what you carry inside of you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That, that worship song by Brian and Katie tore out, when you walk into the room, everything changes. When I sing that song, I see us. When you walk into the room, everything should change. Light and love should come crashing through the door when you walk into the room because you carry something inside of you. The problem with the church is not that we don't have the spirit. The problem with the church at large is we don't know how to use it. We are not aware of what magnitude of dynamite we carry around inside of us. And if we even began to tap into it this much, the things that could change. There is no, we were in, we were in a crazy Uber situation the other night that was full of darkness. It was hysterical. I mean, it was like we were just sitting there with a bunch of demons in the car. And at first I felt super intimidated. And then I was like, Heck no. Like there was just this roar. And so I was like, come on, Jesus, give me a word for him. Give me a word for him. Just give me a word for him. You know, like just this, I'm not going to be intimidated by you. I know who I am in Christ. You can be any place in the world. I can remember being 19 years old in a military prison full of male killers in Brazil. And I'm a 19 year old little American girl. And the Lord's like, do you know what's on the inside of you? Don't you be intimidated by these men. Don't you be intimidated by what you've, they've done. That night, like 20 men gave their lives to the Lord. It had nothing to do with me. It's who is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I encourage you, when you leave here today, if you go to a restaurant, if you go to work tomorrow, would you just take a second before you walk through the door and be like, light and love are going to crash in here because I'm walking in. 
and light and love reigns in me and power reigns in me because Christ in me, the hope of glory, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is in you. It's in you. It's in you. And we can use it. Even if it's just to love the most unlovely people, the people that are most difficult for you to love, there is a spirit in you that will enable you to do that. That is how we fight. That is how we bring the kingdom of God here on the earth. We have to recognize who we are and what is in us. We have to use the word. Jump ahead real quick to verse 13. Actually, we're going to skip past 13 for the sake of time. Obviously, he goes through the armor, right? The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, our feet are shod. I, I learned it. I memorized it as a child in the King James. So our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, <laughs> the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. But I want to I jump there to 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I know, I feel like Jeremiah and I say this every time we come, but it's Vaughn's fault because Vaughn did this to us. You have to eat this thing. You have to love this thing. You have to read this thing. And you, I, can I just, I know this seems like so simple, but I feel like adults need it as much as when I talk to middle schoolers. If you don't have a passion and a hunger for the word, instead of being like, man, I should really have a passion and hunger for the word. How do I fix that? Why don't you just like take five minutes open your Bible, say, Lord, I don't really enjoy this. I don't enjoy reading this. I'm not passionate about this. I know I should be like, why fake it? He knows how you feel anyway. So just talk about it. You know, I always tell my 12 year old that like, just talk to him like you talk to me because otherwise it's just weird. Right. And, and, and just say, I'm going to read some scriptures right now. Could you possibly like make these come alive to me or make something make a little more sense? You know, and then you begin to study it. And I won't get into that, but man, I just encourage you. I'm sure your pastors have systems for studying the Bible. It is so much fun. Even if you just take one scripture and you see what other scriptures it connects to, and then Google it a little and see what stories that connects to. I mean, it's just so much fun because you find it's like digging through treasure. It really is. I promise you. Jesus, make it, oh, for anyone who doesn't love the word, I'm just believing that that will change today because this becomes something you fight with. When you find yourself standing in situations where the battle feels too much and you no longer want to stay the course, but you want to quit, if this is rooted in you and it is it has become real to you, those scriptures start to go through your mind. I have like 10 of them. And when things get a little hairy and crazy, I just start, I close my eyes and I start saying them to myself. This is who you are. This is what he says about you. This is what you carry. This is who he is. And then you can walk in that. Amen? Okay. Why? Why do we... Oh, real quick. If you look in the next verse, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And... I can't read it. And always keep on praying for all the saints. So aside from the word, there has to be prayer. Pray everywhere you go. Like, you don't have to have, like, a prayer ritual. Just pray. Pray while you're driving. Pray while you're in the shower. Pray while you're doing dishes. I always pray while I'm doing dishes because I despise doing dishes. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I like to vacuum. I really love to vacuum. I hate dishes. <laughs> and so I have a tendency to pray while I'm doing dishes because then I don't hate them anymore because then that's my prayer time. <laughs> Even if I'm just praying in tongues, I'm praying while I do the dishes and it takes away my dirty, rotten, stinking attitude and it's wonderful. Okay. Why? Why are we staying the course? Why are we doing all this? Why are we fighting? Why are we standing? Why are we, why? And it comes in the next verse. What, what uh, Paul's prayer is. This prayer always makes me want to cry a little. This one and the next one. Pray also for me. This is Paul's prayer. This man has been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's been in prison. He's been betrayed. He's been forsaken by friends. He's, he's had a rough go of it pursuing the kingdom of God. He's also the one we're still like learning from thousands of years later. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is why we stay the course. Because we have to fearlessly declare the gospel. Because there are lots of carols out there. 
There are lots of carols that desperately need to know that the Lord loves them, that the Lord is with them, that the Lord sees them intimately and personally. Sometimes we have the masses of 53,000, but other times it's one at a time. One at a time. Most of the time it's one at a time. Your neighbors. Oh, I can tell stories about neighbors right now. We've had some adventures with our unbelieving neighbors lately, and it's amazing. I have six years of journals chronicling the prayers I have prayed for the family on the corner, and I'm finally seeing the fruition of those prayers in the last two years. Just for a family on the corner, nobody's ever going to know who they are. Only we know who they are. But Jesus knows them intimately and personally. How many people are on your corner? And he's right now even bringing them to your mind. Just go for the one. Just pray for the one. Even if that's just where you start. You don't have to go prophesy over them. Build a relationship with them. But start praying for them. And if, and if it's six years later, you're going to see him do it. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And you must stay the course. You can't give up. You can't give up. Because there are stories yet to be written through your life. Magnificent stories. Stories that not only you will remember and they will give you strength to overcome, but just like some of the stories I've told this morning, they'll come back to you in a moment where you need faith. Because what happens? As we seek Him, we build that intimacy with Him, right? And then we begin to remember all he's done. And out of that remembering comes fresh hope. And out of that fresh hope comes more faith. And our faith grows and we can stand longer. We can fight longer. We can continue to put one foot in front of the other and see the next glorious miracle and see the next testimony, even if there's valley, valleys in between. Because ultimately, <laughs> Second Timothy, and this is the last scripture. I know I do a lot of scripture, but it is what it is. I love the Bible. This is the last verse. And I know I have memories of reading this verse in this church before, but that's okay. I read it a lot. This was where Paul, after that prayer that I just read you about pray that I would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. He was still trying to stay the course, right? But let me read you Paul's it is finished. Like Jesus on the cross. Paul finally got to his it is finished. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6. <laughs> for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I stayed the course. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And I think when Paul wrote that, he was thinking of all the people that he had impacted as he stayed the course when it was so hard. When he wanted to give up in his moment in Philippians chapter 1, where he had a choice to live as Christ, to die as gain. He had a lot of times he could have not stayed the course, but he did. And in this final moment, he said, all right, I'm out of here. I've done it. It is finished. There's a reward for me and not just for me, but all these ones, all these ones that are going to see him face to face because of my life. One day we will all stand before him. And he's going to smile at you. And my prayer for you is that behind you, you're going to turn and you're going to see all the lives, all the lives that because of your willingness to stay the course, because of your willingness to get over a fence with other people in the church, because of your willingness to humble yourself, because of your obedience, because of your pursuit of him, so many other people will call him Lord, will know his love, will know that he sees them. It's time for the church to arise like never before. Jeremiah said it Friday night, creation is groaning. We live in Florida. We've seen a lot of creation groaning lately. Creation is groaning. The world is in upheaval, but the church will stay the course. The church will fight. The church will stand.
and we will finish what Jesus started. Amen. I want to just pray for you, and then if we want to just take a second to just Father, I thank you for every one of us in this room, Lord Jesus, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would cement what you've done in our hearts today, that you would cement for each person, not what I've said, but what they need to hear from you, Jesus. Just cement it in their hearts and let it bear fruit. Speak clearly to every one of us today, Father, that we could stay the course until we are done with this beautiful, passionate, wild life you've given us, God. In Jesus' name.